Wednesday, August 14th. There was little air activity over Britain today. ...of the last three days. In the early morning hours, German bombers attacked the Midlands and Wales, and London reported some damage was caused. In Berlin, there was an air raid alarm shortly after midnight, and then it was reported that German anti-aircraft batteries had turned back RAF planes ten miles away from Berlin. And now for the news in the German capital, as reported by Edwin Hartwich. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Berlin. So far this morning, there have been no new bulletins issued by the German high command, indicating that heavy air attacks on Great Britain are continuing into the fourth day, that we may have news of the activities of German air force later in the day. But if the aviators have been given a temporary rest, there's no let-up on the war being waged by the Ministry of Propaganda against the British Ministry of Information and the Churchill government. The bone of contention is the discrepancy in the losses reported by the Germans and by the British, or I should say, the conflict about which Air Force shot down the greatest number of enemy planes. The German papers this morning are emphatic as regards to one statement. They accuse the British of falsifying their plane losses and exaggerating their victories. London is not willing to admit that the Germans have gained superiority in the air, writes one paper. Then the Bates are down claims that the English counties on the Channel Coast have been placed under martial law so as to prevent the British people from discovering the extent of the destruction and the Portsmouth, Portland, and other harbors. And the Berlin papers are printing front page stories about the worldwide interest and reactions to the German air raids on England. Here are some of the headlines to give you an idea of their content. Tremendous interest in the United States. The whole world dazzled by German successes. And the John Radio this morning, in discussing the attacks, announced, quote, In fact, the American papers already speak of German air domination over the channel, end quote. This morning, the German news agency has issued a revised list of losses suffered by the British in yesterday's air fights. According to a new account, the British Air Force lost a total of 132 132 pursuit planes and bombers yesterday. And here is the breakdown of this new report. The Germans claim that 74 planes of the Royal Air Force were shot down over the Channel and England yesterday. Then, a complete flight of 16 Bristol Blenheim bombers was shot down when they attempted to attack the Aarberg Airport in Denmark. The 100% destruction of this flight marks the one perfect bullseye in the German reports. Another 42 planes were destroyed on the ground at England yesterday or shot down while flying over Germany. And some fresh details about yesterday's engagements are also released this morning from official quarters. German bombers attacked harbors, factories, ships, balloon barges, and anti-aircraft batteries in England yesterday. The docks and caves of Walsend, Hartlepool, Plymouth, and Bournemouth, a south coast resort town, were also bombed. Incidentally, when I visited Bournemouth three years ago, the only cave sticking out from the sandy beach was an amusement pier stretching about a thousand feet into the English Channel. The High Command reports this morning that armament factories at Bristol and Exeter were bombed yesterday, and a large oil depot at North Billingham. Airports at East Church, Belting, Farnborough, and Odaham, O-D-I-H-A-M, were also bombed. The Germans claim the 30 British planes were destroyed on the ground at these fields, as well as hangars, gasoline dumps, and buildings. Then a balloon barrage at Folkestone on the south coast was attacked, and 12 of the balloons were shot down. And with this revised report issued this morning, the total number of British planes that the German state they were shot down is posted to 281, 281, for three days, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And in, in that period of intensified aerial activity, the Germans say that they lost only 69 planes. Incidentally, their losses of 13 planes yesterday has now increased to 24 ships. At the plan office this morning, it was stated that Germany will accept the Italian version regarding the conflicting reports of the Greek Albanian dispute. And then this morning, there was an item that Norwegian copper, sulfur, and iron mines are being reopened under German supervision. Some of these mines have not been worked since 1789. This is Edwin Hartwig, I've returned now to Columbia in New York. That was Edwin Hodrich reporting from the German capital. And here is a dispatch we have just received. Rome. British planes this morning bombed Milan, Turin, Alessandria, and Tortonia in northern Italy. 
An Italian communique says 12 persons were killed and 44 wounded in Milan. And it claims one was killed and eight wounded at Turin and nine killed at Alessandria. Now, for the report of Larry Lesur, we take you to the British capital. Go ahead, London. This is London. The score of yesterday's mass German raids on Britain is announced as a new record this morning. 78 German planes are claimed to have been shot down. 13 British fighter planes were destroyed. But 10 of the pilots will live to fight another day. Some 500 planes were reported over England yesterday. Probably the greatest number of destructive air weapons this war has yet known. Responsible quarters here are of the opinion that the past week's raids on Britain are being carried out to test Britain's resistance in the air. This test is believed a preliminary to an invasion. In smaller numbers, the German planes continued during the night and early today the attack on Britain. Points in England, Wales, and Scotland were bombed. Unconfirmed reports reached London yesterday that the southeast coast, that is, the coast nearest France, had been shelled by long-range German artillery. So I hurried down to the coast to attempt to confirm this new phase of the Battle of Britain. Darkness had fallen by the time I reached there, but the district was undergoing its fifth air raid alarm in 24 hours. Next morning, shortly after the sun came up over German conquered France across the channel, the air raid sirens sounded again. I stood out on a balcony in my hotel, the very place which reports to America claimed was spattered by machine gun fire the day before. I saw no evidence of machine gun bullets on or around the hotel. When I questioned my colleagues about this, they merely smiled knowingly. I could see nothing except the wave-tossed channel and the silver-painted barrage balloons riding high overhead. But an airplane was droning out of sight in the clouds. Then came the nervous, angry stutter of a machine gun. The big elephant-like balloon, about a quarter mile from the hotel, began to collapse. A great puff of yellow flame and black smoke mushroomed out of it. It sank slowly out of control. The long cable holding it to the truck whipped off and lashed into the sea. The engine drone in the clouds continued. Again, that angry chatter. Another fat, benign-looking balloon sagged like a stricken elephant and fell slowly, gushing smoke and flame. Then the droning in the clouds ceased, and the all-clear signal sounded. I learned where the reported shells had fallen the day before and walked over to the area. I saw a large yellow stucco house with its roof completely ripped off. Soldiers were examining shell fragments which lay nearby. They assured me that nothing but a cannon-fired shell could have caused that damage, that the pieces they picked up were certainly shell fragments. They said the house had been blown up ten minutes after the oil clear had sounded when there were no enemy planes overhead. I examined another point where a reported shell had fallen. It was in the side of a road. There was a very small crater. Apparently, the missile had exploded on impact. There were many smaller holes in the earth nearby, undoubtedly shrapnel. There were three other reported shell craters in the vicinity. None of them were as conclusively the result of artillery fire as the first two. I was told by the soldiers that the shell fragments denoted a relatively small caliber missile, about eight or nine inches in diameter. This is with the evidence of Big Bertha, which fired on Paris from about 70 miles away in the last war. A small shell lobbed high into the stratosphere with a huge powder charge behind it. Ordnance experts explained to me that the German guns were probably more distant than the 22 miles separating France from England. Probably about 10 miles inside the French coast, well camouflaged to conceal them from cameras of the Royal Air Force spotting planes. We have just had a hint here of what Britain's answer may be to offers to send food to German conquered territories. A motion is expected in the House of Lords today. In effect, it will call attention to the danger of famine threatening friendly people under Nazi domination and ask whether Britain will allow food to go to these parts of Europe if the German forces are withdrawn. We return you now to CBS in New York. That was Larry Lesseur speaking to you from the British capital. And here in New York, Linton Wells is standing by with more news and his analysis of the news. Mr. Wells. The sudden lull in German air raids on the British Isles this morning, as our correspondents Edward Hartridge and Larry Lesseur just reported from Berlin and London, probably indicates that the Nazis, having felt out the enemy, so to speak, are now marshalling their might for an even more vigorous onslaught. For three days, the Germans have blasted away intensively at British factories, airports, communications, and civilian centers. 
Now quite likely, they are studying the sex of incendiary and high-explosive bombs and are preparing to strike at what they now believe to be the most strategic points. Their hope, in fact, their salvation is to win quick superiority in the air and thereby make an invasion possible. Recently, the Nazis undoubtedly have suffered far greater aircraft and personnel losses than they admit. But as those losses are likely less than the British claim, they have made little more than a dent in the tremendous force which Goering has been able to build up in Germany. So during the coming days, we may well expect to hear about air attacks on an even greater scale, with wave after wave of bombers roaring over the English, Scottish, and Welsh countrysides, seeking to destroy all life, manufacturing establishments, sources of supply, and above all, morale. If I know anything about the British and about the effects of bombing raids, the Nazis must shoot the works on a truly horrible scale during the next 50 days. Otherwise, the future will be even more doubtful than it is now. The next week or so should reveal if the Germans have the capacity to do just that. The Swiss had air raid scares last night as British planes roared across Switzerland headed for effective bombings of industrial centers in northern Italy. But this morning, the Swiss have more reason to turn fearful eyes toward Italy and Germany than toward the skies. Today, the Italian newspaper Regime Fascista of Cremona began an attack against Switzerland, which looks like another build-up for action against the neutral. Sneering at Swiss neutrality, the regime fascista accused Swiss newspapers of insulting Germany and Italy and advised Italians living in Switzerland to defend themselves. The Italian paper said that Italy cannot remain indifferent when fascism and its men are offended and when false news is published with the aim of discrediting Italy. Then it concluded with this warning. All great events arise from small episodes and great oaks from little acorns grow. Coincidentally with this new press attack against Switzerland, the Italian newspapers are intensifying their campaign against Greece. Yesterday, Premier Metoxas of Greece firmly rejected official Italian suggestions that Greece formally renounce British guarantees of her independence and territorial integrity and place herself under the protection of the Rome-Berlin Axis. Consequently, the Italian press is now charging that the Metoxas government, with supreme arrogance, as it terms it, has designs on Albanian territory which must be destroyed by quick and decisive action. So it is not improbable that soon we shall be hearing about Italian punitive action against Greece. In such an eventuality, observers are pondering over what action Turkey will take. The Turks have are treaty bound to enter the war with England if there is any change in the status quo in the eastern Mediterranean. Well, there was a change in the status quo when Italy declared war two months ago, but nothing happened vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. So treaties being what they are these days, it may well be that nothing will happen so far as Turkey is concerned should Italy invade Greece. But if Italy should manage to gain a good foothold in Greece, she will be in a better position to hamper British fleet operations in the eastern Mediterranean and also to attack Palestine and sources of British oil supply in the Near East. There doesn't seem to be much change in the Anglo-Egyptian, uh, Anglo-Italian situation in British Somaliland. The British say that their Somali forces have been fighting the Italians since Sunday at Jugargan Pass, 43 miles south of Berber in the vicinity of Adadle, and have broken up several general attacks. The Italians say they have occupied Adadle. The real significance of this news is that the Italians apparently abandoned any attempt uh, by its main Hargesha column to reach Berbera on the main road leading there from Odwena through the mountains by way of Barau and Sheikh and struck off on what is little uh, more than a trail. If they have occupied Adadli, they can now move into the coastal lowlands, connect with their forces struggling eastward over the hot sands along the Gulf of Aden from Zela, and make a more large-scale attack against Berbera. Although there is no word regarding it, the likelihood is that the Italian column, which occupied Bahatli Wells in southeastern Somaliland last week, is now moving northwestward toward Barao, whence it will attempt to storm the mountain pass leading down to Berbera by way of Sheikh, which sees the British government. With this report and analysis of the news by Nathan Wells, CBS correspondents have reported on the latest developments in the European situation. Tony Marvin speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Friday, August the 16th. With the great air raids of yesterday and last night only a few hours past, it is reported this morning that German bombers and flighting planes are again over southeast British coastal towns. Berlin says a renewal of the attacks awaits only clearing of mists over the channel. 
In Rome, the Italian high command says British planes raided North Italy again last night, but there are no details. But now the news direct, as reported by Columbia's correspondents in London and Berlin, following which there will be an analysis of the news by Linton Wells. First, the report of Larry Lesseur from the British capital. Go ahead, London. This is London. I am speaking from a crowded air raid shelter, two floors underground. This morning, large forces of German bombers are continuing their unprecedented attempt to bomb England. We do not know yet how many more planes the Royal Air Force have added to their record score of yesterday when the Air Ministry announced that the RAF had destroyed 144 out of a German armada of 1,000 planes for the loss of only 27 British fighters. During last night, the Midlands area of England was heavily bombed. One raid lasted three hours. Naturally, there were casualties, as yet undetermined. Two nurses were seriously hurt when a sanatorium in the Midlands was hit. But the 330 patients were taken safely to air raid shelters. Yesterday, the German Air Force launched 11 attacks along a 500-mile front. When the sirens sounded in London, I watched all traffic stop for a moment. Buses unloaded their passengers at air raid shelters. But before the all-clear signal sounded, the buses were running again, and people stood in little knots on street corners, watching the skies. Like almost every large city, London's airport was erected far out in the suburbs as a sort of afterthought. It takes a taxi about 20 minutes to get to Croydon from the center of London. Unlike airports in America, Croydon Field is a great expanse of lush green grass. It has no asphalt runway. I made the familiar trip to Croydon this morning, where in peacetime, big transport planes skimmed off the gently rolling turf to Paris, about an hour away. But this morning, the grass of Croydon was colored a dirty greenish white. Dust thrown up by German bombs dumped there last evening. A number of the buildings that surround the vast field were in ruins. An army of tin-helmeted air raid wardens were digging and searching. They had been working all night by the light of flares. Probably the first lights that have appeared at night in London since last September 1st. The number of air raid wardens was matched only by the number of little boys who had made the long trip out to the bombed airport on their bicycles. Like small boys the world over, these little English fellows were busy picking up bits of rubble as souvenirs. I was astonished by the number of people who walked around wearing a neat white bandage on their heads, like a skull cap. The reason was apparent. Croydon Airfield is surrounded by small, neat, suburban houses. The ones nearest the field had their shingled roofs holed by falling bricks. I learned that most of these injuries were slight, but they served to give London's air raid ambulance girls the opportunity to use some of the skill they had acquired in 11 months of assiduous practice. Most of this this morning's onlookers were in almost holiday mood, eager and curious. But the persons who lived in the little houses near the bombed field were obviously shaken by their experience. They were just recovering from that stunned expression you can see on the faces of people who have been in an auto crash. The results of the German raid were obviously not important so far as military objectives are concerned. It was more in the nature of a spectacular feat, probably intended to demonstrate that the air defenses of London can be penetrated at will. If this were the German object, they obviously succeeded. But if they figured to break the morale of the London populace, they have just as obviously failed. For even those people wearing the skull caps, the white bandages, managed to grin very often. Yesterday, they were obscure suburbanites. Today, they are heroes in the eyes of their neighbors. This is Larry Lesseur, returning you to CBS in New York. That was Larry Lesseur reporting from London. And here are some late dispatches we have just received. Rome. The government denied today that the unidentified submarine which torpedoed the Greek mine layer Hela yesterday afternoon was Italian. Another dispatch from Rome. British planes for the second time this week, early today, roared over northern Italy, and the General Headquarters communique admitted that two persons were killed and five wounded in raids on Marite and Ogliate in the northern rural section of Italy. The communique, which said the British planes had crossed Switzerland en route to their Italian objectives, claimed that Italian anti-aircraft guns in the Turian area had shot down one British plane near Cresola de Alba. The crew was said to have consisted of five men, some of whom were killed while the remainder were captured. And now for news of the German capital and the report of Edwin Hartwich, we take you to Berlin. 
This is Berlin. The official German news agency reports that the weather conditions along the English Channel are bad this morning. So operations of the German Air Force today may be reduced in consequence. Last night, we are told that bombing raids of the Germans continued. This time, the objectives were the industrial centers in the Midlands and northeastern England. But at this moment, we have no further details. The roundup of yesterday's daylight operations has been given out by the German High Command. In the large-scale fighting, virtually over all of England, the Germans claim they shot down 98 British planes and destroyed eight others on the ground. At the same time, the Germans say they lost only 29 planes. Also, the Germans say that five more balloons were knocked down in their attacks on the barrage at Dover yesterday. Then we are also presented with a summary for the last week, up to 8 p.m. last night. In that period, the German High Command states that 505, 505 British planes were destroyed, while 129, 129 German planes are considered lost. That is the accounting from the Berlin side of the fight. No doubt Mr. Merrill has something to tell you about the British accounts for the same period. <laughs> However, as regards the British reports, the Focusier Beobachter sums up the official feelings here in its front page headline today as follows. So they lie, so they will continue to lie. The German press and the high command has given no indication that the air attacks on Britain <clears throat> and the results are not going according to schedule. For instance, the Bedford Mittag writes this morning, quote, Our planes have conquered the superiority of the air over England. The British coastal fortifications have been crushed within a few days, end of quote. Then the paper accuses Winston Churchill of having multiplied the German losses by 40. And then, by adding up the resulting British figures, the German airplane losses would amount to 11,000 planes, this paper claims. Well, that's a little problem to cry out in the editing machine these days by waiting for more concrete news. This morning, the Berlin papers do not report that German planes bombed Croydon Airport outside of London. They report that London had its fifth air raid alarm since the start of the war when German planes passed overhead, but no bombs were dropped, although the London anti-aircraft batteries went into action, we read. But the Berlin radio picks up and broadcasts an associated press story about the attack on Croydon, and that large columns of smoke were seen over the London airport. Incidentally, the official news agency this morning denies the English reports that the Germans used over a thousand planes in the attacks on Britain yesterday. The Deutsches Nachrichten Bureau writes this morning that only 200 bombers and about 320 Messerschmitt fighter planes took part in the day-long air battle over Great Britain. So that is all we have to report on air activity this morning. The Deutsche Zeitung, the German paper for occupied Holland, reports that Joseph Simon, who was a German civil administrator for the tiny duchy of Luxembourg, has decreed that there is to be no longer, quote, a grand duchy of Luxembourg, unquote. The constitution of Luxembourg is no longer valid, he states in his decree, because the government has fled. The oath of public officials to the former government is canceled out, and they are ordered to pledge their loyalty to the new German administration. Britain is watching with interest the finished crisis, which has developed with the resignation of Mr. Tanner, the Foreign Affairs Minister, who Willem Strauss has said this morning. However, Germany is taking no action, nor any official attitude, in the Finnish affair, the Foreign spoke Office spokesman added. There is a story of a propaganda company reporter in one paper this morning that six unidentified Americans were picked up by a German naval vessel when a 9,700-ton Dutch ship was captured in the Atlantic Ocean while en route from Panama to England. The six Americans, including a missionary and his wife, were unloaded in France and taken to the French-Spanish border where they were turned over to American consular officials, we are told. This is Edwin Hartridge returning now to Columbia in New York. That was Edwin Hartridge speaking to you from Berlin. Here in New York, Linton Wells is standing by with more news and his analysis of the news. Mr. Wells. From the looks of things, the British have demonstrated uh, that not only can they take it on the chin, they can also dish it out. Although Edwin Hartridge said from Berlin that uh, most German planes were grounded by mist today, our correspondent Larry Lasseur told us from a British air raid shelter this morning that the Nazi Air Force is continuing yesterday's 16-hour attacks 
while Britain remains undisturbed over the fact. More than 1,000 German warbirds strafed England, Scotland, and Wales for 16 continuous hours yesterday and are at it again now, according to Mr. Lesseur. While English fighter planes and anti-aircraft were and are taking their toll of Nazi war machines, the RAF was doing some blitzkrieging on its own account against German and Italian bases, showing that two can play at the same game. Most experts are still of the opinion that a fortnight's continuance of Nazi air operations will prove, one way or another, if Hitler's forces are capable of bringing Britain to her knees. As British planes reportedly continue their night raids on northern Italy, Rome grows more incensed at Switzerland. Although the Swiss are lodging a vigorous protest with Whitehall against RAF planes flying over the Alps on their way to Italy, the fascists are threatening drastic action against Switzerland on the grounds that the Swiss are in reality cooperating with the British. Coming on the heels of the Italian press campaign charging Switzerland with insulting Italy and Germany and urging Italian residents of Switzerland to defend themselves, it is not beyond the bounds of probability that the fascists are preparing for some sort of punitive action against Helvetia, as they are apparently against Greece. There has been no explanation so far of yesterday's mysterious submarining of a Greek mine layer off the island of Tinos and the subsequent torpedoing of a key with considerable loss of life. But there are reports from Athens that Italian planes have attacked the Greek steamer Frinton off the island of Crete. Rome professes ignorance about these attacks, but the Italian press continues to charge that Greece is a tool of Great Britain in a plot to upset the peace of southeastern Europe and is promising a strong Italian answer. This would seem to be leading up to an Italian demand for Greek territory, which will probably be granted, thus complicating Britain's position in the eastern Mediterranean. Yesterday, you will recall, the United States Marines managed to obtain control of the most important sector of the former British section of Shanghai, an area which includes the downtown business, banking, and hotel district, and the Wangpu River waterfront. This left the United States the sole Occidental nation in a position to uphold the rights of the open-door policy in China. The Japanese made no effort to conceal their disgruntlement over the failure of their efforts to gain complete control of Shanghai's international settlement, and it was prophesied freely that Tokyo would reject the plan. This morning, it is reported from Shanghai that an official Japanese spokesman has made a summary demand upon American officials to turn over the newly allotted British sector to the Nipponese. To submit to these demands would be tantamount to complete surrender of all American and all Occidental rights in China, while Secretary of State Hall has said on more than one occasion must be reject re respected and maintained. So the probability is that the Nipponese demands will be summarily rejected by Washington. But the Japanese are not people who understand the meaning of the word no. So the probability is that the American Marines in Shanghai are in for a warm time of it during the weeks to come. How far the Japanese militarists will go remains to be seen. But heretofore, they have shown little respect for any foreign power's rights except those of the United States to a mild degree. Now that they are in a position for a real showdown with America, it is too much to expect that caution will characterize their dealing with the situation. If simple pinpricking and vocal protests were likely to be the extent of Japanese pressure, there would be no cause for concern. But the Nipponese are extremists in all things, and apparently they have gone too far to back down. So it would be wise to keep one vigilant eye on Shanghai and the other on Washington and Tokyo. And in Siam, judging by reports from Tokyo, the Japanese are fostering a Siamese move to obtain restoration of territory from French Indochina. Five Siamese divisions were said to be concentrating along the French Indochina border and threatening invasion. With this report and analysis of the news by Linton Wells, CBS correspondents in London, Berlin, and New York have brought you the latest reports on the current European situation. Tony Marvin speaking. This is the Columbia... Monday, August 19th. All of England is now a defense area. A lone German plane bombed the southeast coastal town early today. Some damage was reported. Other than that, there was general quietness in the air, according to Press Association reports. From Berlin came word that planes are heading towards Great Britain to observe the damage caused in yesterday's mass air raids against England. And of this raid, England says she administered to Germany the greatest aerial defeat of the war. In Africa, the Italians claim to have broken British defenses around Berbera, the capital of Somaliland. From Cairo, the British report that RAF planes bombed the Italian airdrome at Addis Ababa and Ethiopia. 
And now for the report of Edward R. Murrow in the British capital. Go ahead, London. This is London. Britain today claimed the greatest proportionate defeat of the German Air Force yet scored in the war. An Air Ministry communique was issued early this morning. It contained only 11 words. It said, It is now known that 140 enemy aircraft were destroyed yesterday. The Royal Air Force lost only 16 of its fighter planes, but the pilots of eight are safe, says the Air Ministry. It is reported that planes are over a southeast coastal town this morning. Today's RAF communique from Cairo says that their bombers raided Addis Ababa and bombed the military aerodrome at that city in Abyssinia. Direct hits were registered on four hangars, and a gasoline fire was started as a result of the bombing. More than 600 German bombers and fighters crossed the coast of England yesterday in three night attacks. According to several London newspapers, all the German planes were on their way to attack London. But according to official sources, the German raiders were seeking military objectives on London's outskirts. In the last raid of the day, 70 German bombers turned back when greeted by a shrapnel barrage over the Thames estuary. During last night and early today, the German Air Force confined itself to sending over airplanes one at a time. A few bombs were dropped in the darkness on the southeast coast. The Ministry of Home Security issued a new order this morning. The 12 regional commissioners of Britain, appointed some time ago, are now given complete authority to issue any orders or directions required for the defense of their respective areas. This means, in effect, that these 12 men are dictators. And if communication should be broken by a German landing, they will be able to act on their own authority. This new order is a precautionary measure and places no immediate fresh restrictions on public freedom. The London press this morning is unanimous in its welcome for the creation of the American-Canadian Joint Defense Board. There is not a great deal of speculation concerning the implications of this move, but the general impression given to British readers is that it is the first step towards a complete military alliance between Canada and the United States. The opinion is current in London that the United States will secure, probably by lease, military bases in British possessions to help guard the approaches to North America. Official quarters still refuse to link these conversations concerning military bases with a possible deal involving the transfer of those 50 American destroyers to Britain. London is watching with keen interest the progress of the American Army transport ship American Legion, homeward bound from Patsamo. The German warning and request that the American Legion should change course is promptly displayed in today's papers, as is the State Department's reply that the ship will proceed on her original course. Reports from Washington fail to make clear the exact grounds on which the American government declined to send, decided to send this vessel through admittedly dangerous waters. Wireless communication with submarines at sea is difficult. This fact was demonstrated when a British submarine torpedoed a French heavy cruiser several days after the order had been issued that no further French ships were to be attacked. The British submarine had failed to receive the order. The British censors are again under fire. The Daily Telegraph reports exasperation in America over the Germans' nine-hour lead in air raid news to the United States. American press messages paying tribute to the high morale and calm conduct of the Londoners were held up for many hours. The Daily Express says, How long is this gagging to go on? Last week we fought and won a great battle, but all the Americans heard of it was a daily gobbled version. On Thursday and Friday and again in the Sunday papers, our good friends had to take Germany's word that London was in ruin. The editors ruefully printed these stories in big type because there was little else to fill their columns, says the Express. Most American correspondents in London share the sentiments voiced by the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Express. Exasperation is a pale and inadequate word to describe a reporter's feelings when he has a good story which does not reveal military secrets and is unable to get it out. I return you now to CBS in New York. That was Columbia's report from London by Edward R. Murrow. Here's a dispatch from Basel, Switzerland. British airplanes early today bombed an aluminum works across the border in Germany from Rheinfelden, Switzerland. Now the news from the German capital by Edwin Hartridge. Go ahead. This is Berlin. Last night, German planes attacked oil depots in the London area, ammunition factories at Norwich and Essex, in the harbors of Milford Haven, Avonmouth, Bournemouth, and Weymouth, according to the high command communique just released. 
Airfields in South England and those near Liverpool were also bombed, it is claimed here. The Germans stated yesterday and last night a total of 147 British planes were shot down, of which 23 were destroyed on the ground or by anti-aircraft fire. Also, the British Defense Forces are reported to have lost 23 barrage balloons, while for the day and night operations, the Germans say they lost only 36 planes. The German government has sent the British government a note through the Swiss Diplomatic Service regarding parachute troops and their operations. This is an answer to a British note sent the same way on May 13th. At that time, the British government told Berlin that if parachute troops were dressed in a recognized uniform, they would be treated in accordance with international rules covering enemy soldiers. But if German parachutists were disguised, they would be treated accordingly as spies are disposed of. The foreign office here this morning, in disclosing this diplomatic exchange, gave the details of Berlin's answer. The German government pointed out that parachute troops wear a recognizable uniform that was displayed at parades as far back as 1936. They are legal combatants, according to all international laws, it was stated. And then the German government warned the British that if parachute troops suffered any illegal treatment, that reprisals would be taken on British aviators, now in German prison camps. If adhering to its course, the United States Army Transport, the American Legion, entered the danger zone at 5 a.m. this morning, while en route from Petsamo, Finland, to New York. This danger zone was so identified by the German government in a warning sent to the American Embassy last week. This area lies to the northwest of Scotland. The Transport American Legion is scheduled to pass through a channel between Cape Wrath at the northwest corner of Scotland and a small island formation of Rona. The ship will clear this danger zone by tonight, we understand here, provided that it encounters no difficulties. As you will remember, on Saturday, the Germans announced that they could assume no responsibility for anything that might happen to the American Legion. The official news agency stated here that the American Embassy had asked for a guarantee of safe conduct for the vessel, but this was not granted. The German press this morning is mainly interested in the foreign policy statements made by Wendell Wilkie in his acceptance speech at Elwood, Indiana, on Saturday night. All published stories this morning report that Mr. Wilkie severely criticized President Roosevelt's foreign policies as bringing the United States to the brink of war without consideration of the wishes of American citizens. But there is little in the press this morning about another American development, that of the announcement of the formation of a joint defense council for the Canadian and United States governments. This was disclosed by President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Mackenzie King the other day. However, some hint of Berlin's reaction can be found in what the German radio had to say this morning. Quote, This decision of the United States President and the Canadian Prime Minister constitutes the incorporation of Canada into the political system of the United States. In Canada, like the Philippine Islands, is placed under the military guardianship of the United States government. And there's one other American item in the news this morning. The propaganda ministry has placed a ban on all Metro Goldwyn Mayer films in the Greater Reich, effective August 15th. MGM's Roaring Lion is accused by one paper of being a first cousin to the British Lion. The paper states, quote, that he tried to equal his British relative in propagandistic agitation against Germany. End of quote. We're coming now to Columbia in New York. This is New York. Columbia now switches you back across the ocean to the Italian capital for the latest news reported by Cecil Brown from Rome. Go ahead, Rome. This is Rome. Italian troops have broken through the second line of British defenses in British Somaliland. The high command has just announced that the British forces are in full retreat toward their transport ships at Tarabara. These ships are being heavily attacked by Italian bombers. One British plane has been shot down by Italian fighters. The town of Rafarouk, about 40 miles from Babar, has been captured. The fascists appear to be moving on Hamas, about 25 miles from the capital of the British colony. It's expected that a secondary column of the Italian forces will converge with the main column at Hamas for the final push on Babar. At the same time, a third column is advancing from Zaire along the Gulf of Aden toward Berber for a pincer movement. Fascist circles consider the British retreat as the collapse of all British resistance in Somaliland. The 
British took the initiative in the air in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. They raided their former coast of Kethera, now the advanced Italian position in the Sudan. The Italian High Command says there was neither damage nor victims. Kassara is 18 miles from the Ethiopian frontier. The British also attacked Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, causing the death of two persons and injuring five. A communique reports the bombs hit some sheds containing old equipment. The Italians raided Sidi Barani, the British base in Egypt near the Libyan frontier. A communique reports an attack also was made on Sarum, hitting encampments and motorized units. Sarum is an important British concentration also near the Libyan border. All the Italian planes were reported safe after their attacks on Sidi Barani and Sarum. Three cities in northern Italy were raided by the British again last night. At Milan, the High Command reports three bombs struck at Robbing, and others fell in open country. Bombs were dropped on Cuneo in Turin, both near the French frontier. Only minor damage was caused, said the High Command, and there were no victims. The British also dropped leaflets, telling the Italians they were forced into the war to fight on behalf of Hitler and against Italian interests. It's indicated here that Italian submarines may participate in what is called the total blockade of Britain. Yesterday it was announced that a fascist submarine had torpedoed a 9,000-ton British tanker in the Atlantic. This was the first word that the Italians had forced Gibraltar, even under the sea. There's no way of telling, of course, how many fascist submarines are on the other side of Gibraltar. One newspaper points out this morning that the British control of Gibraltar cannot impede Italian submarines from freely negotiating the strait. Mussolini's own newspaper, the Popolo d'Italia, considers the Nazi blockade of England as the first measure in a new program to crush Britain. Here's how the Duce's paper expresses it. The revolution must save Europe and civilization at any cost. If, to save it, the paper adds, England must be destroyed, it will be destroyed. The Popolo di Roma says that in all the world's newspapers, not a single voice was spoken in favor of England and against Germany for the blockade. This shows, claims the paper, that Britain is politically and morally isolated. The fascist press claims a great victory in repulsing the British naval and air attack on Port Bardi in Libya yesterday. Bardi is near the Libyan-Egyptian frontier. We're told here this morning that in the British Armada, there were four cruisers, eight destroyers, and an aircraft carrier. British fighter planes shot off the carrier's decks and were engaged by Italian planes. At the same time, the ships offshore, uh, the ships offshore poured 300 shells into Bardi and the surrounding area. Seven British fighters the fighter planes were shot down, the high command said, and three Italian planes failed to return. It's reported today, however, two other British fighters were destroyed, bringing the total to nine. Some of the British ships were said to have been hit by bombs. This is Cecil Brown in Rome. I return you now to CBS in New York. Here in New York is a dispatch from Shanghai. There are indications that the negotiations between American and Japanese military leaders in Shanghai are hopelessly deadlocked. The two are at odds over control of the British defense sectors of the international settlement. And this morning, Rear Admiral Thomas Hart, who commands the United States Asiatic Fleet, announces that the dispute now is the subject of negotiations between Washington and Tokyo. And with this news, Columbia concludes this morning report of European development. Edward R. Murrow reported from London... Edwin Hartridge reported from Berlin and Cecil Brown from Rome. Rather more than a quarter of a year, Mr. Speaker, has passed since the new government came into power in this country. What a cataract of disaster has poured out upon us since then. The trustful Dutch overwhelmed, their beloved and respected sovereign driven into exile, the peaceful city of Rotterdam the scene of a massacre as hideous and brutal as anything in the Thirty Years' War. Belgium invaded and beaten down. Our own fine expeditionary force cut off and almost captured, escaping as it seemed only by a miracle and with the loss of all its equipment. Our ally France out, Italy in against us, all France in the power of the enemy, 
all its arsenals and vast masses of military material converted or convertible to the enemy's use, a puppet government set up at Vichy which may at any moment be forced to become our foe, the whole western seaboard of Europe from the North Cape to the Spanish frontier in German hands, all the ports, all the airfields on this immense front employed against us as potential springboards of invasion. Moreover, sir, the German air power, numerically so far outstripping ours, has been brought so close to our island that what we used to dread greatly has come to pass, and the hostile bombers not only reach our shores in a few minutes and from many directions, but can be escorted by their fighting aircraft. Why, sir? If we had been confronted at the beginning of May with such a prospect, it would have seemed incredible that at the end of a period of horror and disaster, or at this point in a period of horror and disaster, we should stand erect, sure of ourselves, masters of our fate, and with the conviction of final victory, burning unquenchable in our hearts. Few would have believed we could survive. None would have believed that we should today not only feel stronger, but should actually be stronger than we have ever been before. Let us... The great air battle, which has been in progress over this island for the last few weeks, has recently attained a high intensity. It is too soon to attempt to assign limits either to its scale or to its duration. We must certainly expect that greater efforts will be made by the enemy than any he has put forth. Hostile airfields are still being developed in France and the Low Countries, and the movement of squadrons and material for attacking us is still proceeding. It is quite plain, sir, that Herr Hitler could not admit defeat in his air attack on Great Britain without sustaining most serious injury. If, after all his boastings and blood-curdling threats and lurid accounts trumpeted round the world of the damage he had inflicted, of the vast numbers of our air force he has shot down, so he says, with so little loss to himself, if after tales of the panic-stricken British crushed in their holes, cursing the plutocratic parliament which has led them to such a plight, if after all this, his whole air onslaught were forced, after a while, tamely to peter out. The Führer's reputation for veracity of statement might be seriously impugned. We may be sure, therefore, that he will continue, as long as he has the strength to do so, and as long as any preoccupation he may have in respect of the Russian Air Force allow him to do so. On the other hand, the conditions and course of the fighting have so far been favorable to us. I told the House two months ago that whereas in France our fighter aircraft were wont to inflict a loss of two or three to one upon the Germans, and in the fighting at Dunkirk, which was a kind of no man's land, a loss of about three or four to one, we expected that in an attack on this island we should achieve a larger ratio. This has certainly come true. It must also be remembered that all the enemy machines and pilots which are shot down over our island or over the seas which surround it are either destroyed or captured. Whereas a considerable proportion of our machines and also of our pilots are saved and soon again in many cases come into action. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen, who, undaunted by odds, unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many, to so few. All our hearts go out to the fighter pilots, whose brilliant actions we see with our own eyes day after day. But we must never forget that all the time, night after night, 
month after month, our bomber squadrons travel far into Germany, find their targets in the darkness by the highest navigational skill, aim their attacks, often under the heaviest fire, often with serious loss, with deliberate careful discrimination, and inflict shattering blows upon the whole of the technical and war-making structure of the Nazi power. On no part of the Royal Air Force does the weight of the war fall more heavily than on the daylight bombers, who will play an invaluable part in the case of invasion, and whose unflinching zeal it has been necessary in the meanwhile, on numerous occasions, to restrain. I hope, indeed I pray, that we shall not be found unworthy of our victory if after toil and tribulation it is granted to us. For the rest, we have to gain the victory. That is our task. There is, however, one direction in which we can see a little more clearly ahead. We have to think not only for ourselves, but for the lasting security of the cause and principles for which we are fighting, and of the long future of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Some months ago, we came to the conclusion that the interests of the United States and of the British Empire both required that the United States should have facilities for the naval and air defense of the Western Hemisphere against the attack of a Nazi power which might have acquired temporary but lengthy control of a large part of Western Europe and its formidable resources. We had therefore decided spontaneously and without being asked or offered any inducement to inform the government of the United States that we would be glad to place such defense facilities at their disposal by leasing suitable sites in our transatlantic possessions for their greater security against the unmeasured dangers of the future. The principle of association of interests for common purposes between Great Britain and the United States had developed even before the war. Various agreements had been reached about certain small islands in the Pacific Ocean which had become important at air fueling points. In all this line of thought, we found ourselves in very close harmony with the government of Canada. Presently, we learned that anxiety was also felt in the United States about the air and naval defense of the Atlantic seaboard. And President Roosevelt has recently made it clear that he would like to discuss with us and with the Dominion of Canada and with Newfoundland the development of American naval and air facilities in Newfoundland and in the West Indies. There is, of course, no question of any transference of sovereignty. That has never been suggested or of any action being taken without the consent or against the wishes of the various colonies concerned. But for our own part, His Majesty's government are entirely willing to accord defense facilities to the United States on a 99 years leasehold basis. And we feel sure that our interests no less than theirs and the interests of the colonies themselves and of Canada and Newfoundland will be served thereby. Sir, these are important steps. Undoubtedly, this process means that these two great organizations of the English-speaking democracies, the British Empire and the United States, will have to be somewhat mixed up together in some of their affairs for mutual and general advantage. For my own part, looking out upon the future, I do not view the process with any misgivings. I could not stop it if I wished. No one can stop it. Like the Mississippi, it just keeps rolling along. Let it roll. Let it roll on full flood, inexorable, irresistible, benignant, to broader lands and better days. London After Dark. At this time, the Columbia Broadcasting System brings you a special broadcast, Life in a Blackout in the capital of Great Britain. During the next half hour, you will be in various parts of London, a city which had three air raid alarms today, the nerve center of empire. There will be pickups from various points in London, accounts of work, 
Yes, and of play in this great city of a nation at war. And so we turn you over to Columbia's staff in the British capital, and we take you now to London. The hub of the British Empire in wartime, seen through Canadian eyes, through English eyes, and through American eyes. London at work and at play, from the unceasing grind of England's war effort to the relaxation of the crowds of duty. Come with us round London after dark in wartime. Sandy McPherson has led off our tour through London at the console of the theatre organ in St. George's Hall, notable as the home of magic in the London of Queen Victoria's day. And now we take you into the streets of blacked-out London, down stately crescent-shaped Regent Street, along Shaftesbury Avenue of theatre fame, into Charing Cross Road, London's Tin Pan Alley, and so to Trafalgar Square. Waiting there is Edward Murrow, known to you as Columbia's European director. Come in, Ed Murrow. This is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid sirens. I'm standing here just on the steps of St. Martin's in the Fields. A searchlight just burst into action off in the distance. One single beam sweeping the sky above me now. People are walking along quite quietly. We're just at the entrance of an air raid shelter here, and I must move this cable over just a bit so people can walk in. I can see just straight away in front of me Lord Nelson on top of that big column. There's another searchlight just square behind Nelson's statue. Just let you listen to the traffic and the sound of the siren for a moment. And then casually, a man stops in front of me to light a cigarette. Here comes one of those big red buses around the corner. Double deckers they are. Just a few lights on the top deck. In this blackness, it looks very much like a ship that's passing in the night, and you just see the portholes. There goes another bus. More searchlights come into action. You see them reach straight up into the sky and occasionally they catch a cloud and seem to splash on the bottom of it. The little traffic lights here, just a small cross on the normal globe, are now red. The cars pull up and stop. I'll just ooze down in the darkness here along these steps and see if I can pick up the sound of people's feet as they walk along. One of the strangest sounds one can hear in London these days, or rather these dark nights, just the sound of footsteps walking along the street, like ghosts shod with steel shoes. A taxi draws up just in front and stops, just waiting for that red light to change to green while the sirens howl. There it goes, and the cars move off. More searchlights are in action. We've not yet seen any burst of anti-aircraft fire overhead. And, of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that there are planes actually over London at this moment. We've had these warnings before, of course. You can hear the sirens just dying away in the distance now. An air raid warden walks out of this shelter. The shelter here, you know, is the crypt underneath this famous old church just on the edge of Trafalgar Square. The crypt where in days of peace homeless men and women were able to find a night's lodging. Just here now, the steps of people coming up into this old church. And so, farewell to Valga Square. And now, after that unexpected air raid warning, we're going to take you to one of London's most ultra hotels, where behind the blackguard drapes, men and women are dancing in the main ballroom. We'll see what the effect is over there after the air raid warning. <laughs> Now, 
in the beams of the searchlights. At the moment, our actual uh, enemy planes are no longer in our vicinity. We heard the drones from overhead, but they seem to have gone away from us now to the northward. And at the moment, the spotter is only using a pair of binoculars. As soon as the searchlights, which about a few seconds ago were zigzagging across the sky, stabbing in all directions a myriad shafts of light looking for those enemy planes. They've all gone out one by one as the plane has passed on its way and we're left here with the men just on their incessant vigil. This is just one of the pieces of practical turnout that they do at any time during the 24 hours and have been waiting to do at any time since this war started. Now beside me is this spot or identification telescope which as soon as the searchlights will get on to an enemy plane, will locate it. From that will be called the bearings and the angles of sight, which will enable a remarkable machine called the predictor in the left pit to get onto the plane, follow the target, and locate the guns. Now, here is the command from the GPO, who is the uh, gun position officer. The predictor works its way around. The men are all standing attention. And now in this dim light, I can see the four long tapering gun barrels staking round till they come to the required bearing, which is in the direction of the expected enemy. Beside me, the height-finding apparatus, which this time is on my right, in the pit on my right, is now calling out the height at which the enemy is expected to come. I can now hear the distant drone of planes, searchlights, stabbing and crisscrossing, across the clear sky and into the cloud and out again. He's some distance away at the moment. All there is here is absolute tenseness and vigilance. That was an anti-aircraft gun post, and no less vital than searchlight units and anti-aircraft batteries is another now familiar aspect of the London wartime scene. Air raid precautions, known simply as ARP. And so next we're going to take you to an ARP post just a few minutes after an air raid warning has sounded, where Larry Lesueur of CBS is waiting to set the scene as he sees it. Good evening, this is Larry Lesueur. The London air raid sirens have just sounded. I'm standing in the vast basement of one of the largest apartment houses in the world. Around me are about a hundred people, but they're only a small fraction of London's great air raids precaution force, which is ready to push to the scene if bombs are dropped in this area. This is the organization the one which the British gift for reducing everything to initials has shortened until it's simply called ARP. These ARP men and women are the ones who are standing by to help their fellow Londoners when the air raid sirens just sent the other eight and a quarter million into the air raid shelters. As I've said before, the sirens have just sounded. And here's how the mechanics of this great air raid precaution system worked. Perhaps some half dozen German bomber pilots penetrated the coastal defenses of Britain a few minutes ago. And they're heading for London. There may be only a half dozen of them, but the killing powers of each man has been multiplied to incredible limits by science and high explosive bombs. And observe in a lonely observation post spotted these German raiders coming over. He telephoned the information to the Air Force Fighter Command. And the Fighter Command determined what point the raiders were heading for. It was London. Then they phoned the London Control Center a few minutes ago. And that telephone message was passed on to the place where I'm standing now, about ten minutes ago. The message said simply, air raid's message yellow. The word yellow stands for the same thing it does in traffic signals. Be on your guard. Everyone here grabbed up their equipment and stood up expectantly, with a keen look on their faces, men and women both. Then the telephone rang again. The words came through, air raid's message red. And a few minutes later, the agonizing wail of the London sirens began, rising and falling in their quavering note. The people in this ARP station all got their equipment ready now, and they've started the motors of their first aid cars and their ambulances. The doctor on duty is busy sterilizing his instruments and preparing his bandages. The German bombers may be nearby now. There's a drone of engines in, in the air. I can't tell, though, whether they're British or German planes. If a bomb drops in this ARP district, a telephone call or a messenger will instantly bring the news of its location. And each of these blue-uniformed ARP men and women carrying their full equipment, which consists of steel helmet, gas mask, gas clothing, boots, first aid equipment, and flashlight, will be driven to the steam in ambulances at fire engine speed. Now, for your benefit, 
Mr. William Sutton, superintendent of this ARP bureau, has arranged for a practice air raid bombing call to arrive at the station. Although no bombs have been dropped nearby, so far as I know. We'll see how long it takes his men and women to get going. There goes the telephone now. Air raid message, Ray. Stretcher party. Ten one, stretcher party. One ambulance, one car to 114 High Street, Sector 220. Messenger. Yes, sir. Stretcher party, one. Stretcher party, 41. Right. You're into the 114 High Street. One ambulance, one car, 114 High Street. Don't forget your helmet. the station already. They've gone. Well, you've just heard the way that two vital spots in London's defense system reacted to an air raid warning. But now, let's get back to the bright lights, away to the west, to the Hammersmith Palais, London's giant dance hall. We'll see what's happening out there now that the sirens have sounded, and we'll see it and hear it from Columbia's Eric Severoid, who's standing with his portable microphone in the thick of the crowd. I'm standing in the middle of a great big dance floor. I guess it's the biggest in England, and it's got the biggest crowd I ever saw trying to dance in one place at one time. There are 1,500 people in the place at the moment. It's 15 minutes before midnight, and that's the wartime closing hour for Saturday night. There was an air raid alarm, as you know, 15 minutes ago. The orchestra leader simply announced they'd go on playing if the crowd wished to stay, and I don't think more than a half a dozen people have left. They simply put up a big cheer and went on with their song. Eddie Carroll's orchestra is playing a song called A Nathan Gale Sang in Barclay Square. This crowd loves this song, and judging from the last one, that partial to O Johnny. We're a long ways from Barclay Square. We're a six-penny bus ride from the heart of London. They come here by bus and subway. This is not Mayfair. Nobody comes here to be seen or to see. They come to dance for the pure pleasure of dancing. And any American who thinks the British are a phlegmatic race should see them dancing around me here tonight. They love dancing, and these shop girls, these workers, these grocers, clerks, these people who make up the stuff of England, they dance wonderfully well. They're not all English by a long ways. New Zealanders, Australians, and Canadian soldiers and sailors are here. And I just met a couple of Texans now in the RAF. There's a few French and Polish soldiers. And there, right in front of me, is a brave looking Dutch officer in his well tailored green, just gliding past. When they come in, these men take off their army boots and they're given little black dancing pumps. This was a dance place at the end of the last war. Well, it seems that it takes more than an air raid siren to dampen the gaiety at the Hammersmith Palais. But now, another long hop back to London's West End from west to east to the hub of the universe, center of cosmopolitan life in happier days, which we hope will soon return. We're taking you to London's heart of hearts, where on a balcony, stories about Piccadilly Circus, Vincent Sheehan of CBS is standing to describe Piccadilly after an air raid warning. Balcony on Piccadilly. Uh, perhaps I'd better tell you exactly where. It's the Piccadilly Hotel, about um, 150 yards from Piccadilly Circus, a little bit beyond St. James's Church. Uh, as you know, I suppose, I don't know if you heard the siren, but there is an air raid on, um, an air raid alarm, that is, 10 or 15 minutes ago. There was plenty of traffic in this street, even in spite of the blackout. Um, now, a good deal of it has drawn up to the curb or disappeared one way or another. People, I suppose, a good many of them have gone into shelters. And um, it's a little bit quieter than it usually is. Even in spite of the blackout and these alarms, which 
people in the center of London don't usually hear much of. Piccadilly is still the center of the shopping and the theater and cafe and restaurant life of London. I had dinner not long ago in a restaurant just off Piccadilly Circus where there were um, Hungarians and Austrians playing their music, much as usual. The food didn't seem much different, nor did the crowd, except there were a lot of officers and um, people on leave from the Army and the Navy Saturday night. They played uh, Viennese waltzes and other music of those countries which uh, no longer are able to play their music. The traffic um, seems to be not very much disturbed by the air raid. We've got taxis, and you probably can hear, I don't know whether you can hear or not, the buses still going on, some of them. The moon has just come up over the black buildings over there on the other side of Piccadilly Circus, the Criterion Restaurant. And uh, the searchlights, which a few minutes ago were uh, stabbing the whole sky with great long beams, seem to have disappeared altogether. Well, that was Piccadilly in the blackout during an air raid warning. And now from Piccadilly, we take you to a London terminus, smoky, sprawling Euston Station. It only costs a penny to buy a platform ticket, which allows us to mingle with the travelers who are about to leave for night rides north. And at Houston, we're going to hear from Michael Standing and Winfred Vaughn Thomas, both of BBC. Well, you're on number 13 platform at Houston Station, and let me tell you right away that this air raid warning has had very little effect here except for slow things down and fast things down a bit. The platform's dim, there are only those very faint blue lights, blue discs lighting up the numbers of the platform, a few little dim red lights, and otherwise complete and abysmal darkness. Well, we are, we are here on this platform to watch the 11.55 up to Manchester start off on our journey. She's got uh, a couple of minutes yet before she starts off, and she's drawn by the Royal Scot, number 6100. You've seen that powerful crimson beauty out there in the United States and Canada some seven years ago, and now here she is back here in our own home country and going to draw her 11 uh, coaches and our complement of passengers up on our routine journey up to the north. Well, Houston's a fairly busy place uh, in this wartime, as the station master, Mr. Harrison, will tell you for himself. That's right, isn't it? Very busy, just, just a pleasant time. Uh, practically... Uh... 50% of our mainline trains today have been duplicated. Incidentally, within the last uh, two hours, we've dealt with approximately 200, wait, 200 tons of uh, newspaper traffic, which is going all over the British Isles. Well, we watch the newspapers being loaded up tomorrow morning, newspapers being taken up to the north. But now this train is a moment or two before she's due to leave, and so let's spend that moment or two pushing through the doors of the YMCA canteen and see what's happening in the canteen. Well, here in the canteen, we've had a constant stream of men in uniform coming in all through the night. Sailors were joining their ships and soldiers piled high with rifles and equipment. And they all seem to want that quick cup of tea. Well, they've been getting it too with truck work efficiency. Because the canteen's been run by an American lady, Mrs. Lieber. Well, she's got a job on all right. Everybody in the services turns up here sooner or later. And they get not only tea, but quick meals, just like burly seaman Bob Smith, who has been tucking in here all night. What are you eating, Bob? Yeah, that's some egg and chips, and they enjoyed it. And some and all day, but you get plenty of food in this country, so you've nothing much to worry about as long as you get a good feed. Well, it's largely due to a seaman like Bob Smith that we're getting that food. But his pal, who is Sapper Hilling, he's also been tucking in. Yes, we've had a jolly fine evening there. We've had eggs and chips and plenty of tea. That's the main thing, as long as we get something to drink and some good food. And they've got that. It takes more than bombs to stop these boys getting into this canteen. And it takes more than bombs to stop that 11.55 going out. And we take you back to the platform now to see if she's getting out on time. We'll pause for a moment, and we're just waiting for the guard to swing his green lamp that's going to set this mighty John train in motion. And here he is, he comes stumbling along back to the van at the rear of the train, and in a moment she'll be starting off on her journey to the north. There's a little activity, all the doors are closed, all the windows, of course, are blacked out, and in a moment or two she'll be pounding away through a blacked out Britain up to Manchester, which she'll reach in about four hours' time. There's 
so a, mo a moment of pause. She's just a trifle late. Of course, this air raid alarm has delayed the arrival of some of the goods that are being carried on us. And the last block of newspapers was only piled into the van just a moment or so back. Is she going to start in time? Well, we haven't got the road yet. She hasn't got the road yet. She may be a moment or two late, but at that rate, you see, there goes the whistle. I don't know whether we've got time to see how that chop out. I don't think we have. But I... Well, seems the only effect of that air raid warning at Houston Station was to make a train a couple of minutes late. And now to our final port of call. Standing in the shadow of the Cenotaph, monument to the fallen of the last great war, is someone who needs no introduction to you wherever you may be. To close our tour of London after dark and London in an air raid warning, J.B. Priestley. I'm sitting at an open window in Whitehall. The roar of traffic has dwindled to the few noises that you probably hear because, of course, of the air raid warning. But we still get a few buses passing, a few cars. Just opposite me is the tall, pale, rather ghostly shape of the cenotaph, commemorating a million dead. Many of them friends of mine, boys that I played with as a boy, men that might have been leaders now. Behind are the great government offices the Home Office, the Colonial Office, the Treasury. It's the heart of our great capital city. It's also historic ground. Henry VIII married Anne Boleyn near here. Elizabeth saw Shakespeare's plays and the masks of Ben Jonson near here. Charles I was executed a few yards from where I'm sitting. It's historic ground, and I think today it's probably more deeply sunk in our world's history than ever because it's the very center of the hopes of free men everywhere. It's the heart of this bastion, this great rock, that's defying the dark tide of invasion that's destroyed freedom all over Western Europe. Soon, I hope, the all clear will come. Soon, I hope, London, which has worked hard, all this week can go quietly to bed can go to sleep I hope it will dream of a better world a world when they could take the balloons out of the sky and the planes dream that dream and not sleep too long but make that dream of a better world come true Good night. London After Dark, London in the Blackout, London in the midst of an air raid alarm, the world's largest city at midnight with air raiders in the vicinity. As this broadcast opened a half hour ago, the sound of sirens was heard, London's fourth air raid alarm of the day, sirens wailing and descriptions of searchlight beams fingering the sky, and you were taken from point to point in this London under alarm. The defenses of London were manned, but the nightlife continued and the dance bands played on. Thursday, August 29th. And today brought another exchange of bombings by the British and Germans. Berlin had its first real taste of death from the skies. There were casualties and some damage. And London had another of its nightly raids, this one lasting more than seven hours. The bombing of the city and of England and Wales generally was the most ferocious thus far in the war. But now the news direct. London and Berlin, afterwards a report from Rome. First the news from the British capital, reported by Eric Severide. Go ahead, London. This is London. When the all clear finally sounded around dawn this morning, London had had its longest air raid of the war. It lasted for seven hours and six minutes. 
single planes were constantly touring over the capital. One would circle over the center of town, while another dropped explosives and firebombs in the suburbs. This morning, they tell us the damage was not very great, particularly to military objectives, because the planes were flying too high for accuracy. Among the places reported destroyed are one church and a Woolworth store. Hundreds of firebombs were dropped on towns and villages over southern England. It's impossible, of course, to get a very accurate check of the damage inflicted. In one southeast town, wardens had to put out 65 fire bombs. From last night's raids, there are no reports of machine gunning. I think there were fewer tired and red eyes this morning in London than earlier this week. More people are sleeping through the raids, but still they are wearisome. The newspaper salesman outside St. Martin in the Fields scrawled out this greeting on his homemade poster. Good yawning, everybody. Some observers here believe these night raids over the capital are purely designed for their nuisance value. Others emphatically dissent. The latter don't believe the Germans would waste time and gas on any such objective as keeping people awake. These observers point out that this kind of raid is not new to England in this war. The same kind of long, drawn-out night flights occurred time and again over South Wales, for example, and prior to mass daylight attacks. If the comparison is correct, the German aims in these single flights over London are to bomb objectives, to make reconnaissance, and to train squadron leaders in night flights over strange ground. So far, the total of German planes reported destroyed yesterday still stands at 24, with a loss of half that many for the RAF. Considering the number of German planes which came over during the day, that figure is not big. It's asserted this morning, however, that this does not mean the RAF defense is weakened. They point out that air victories are not measured solely by the number of opponents shot out of the sky. Yesterday, we're told, many formations of German bombers which came over to attack airfields were broken up by fighters before the fields were reached. That in itself is regarded as victory. Among the fighter aces reported killed this morning is a Belgian, Lieutenant Philippar, who died in action off the southeast coast. He had brought down at least five Germans and probably two more. The British Secret Service in Scotland Yard have begun a citywide hunt for fifth columnists reported showing lights from London rooftops to guide enemy bombers. Scotland Yard has been flooded with telephone calls from flat dwellers who believe they've spotted German agents. Most of these, of course, are cases of accidental lighting. The police are also out to stop, ro- to stop rooftop parties. More than one supper party in London's West End adjourns to the rooftop, and flashlights and matches constitute a possible danger. Italians have admitted the British bombing of the Fiat Works at Turin. A colonist who knows Italy well points out this morning that this admission is an invitation to continue bombing this point. The reason is that this factory has only been producing commercial motors and is being dismantled anyway. Vital Italian arms production has been transferred to Montcaleri, some miles from Turin, and is underground. On the other hand, the Caproni works at Milan and the Savoy factory at Sesto Calenda are important objectives and have been hit. This, we're informed, has really alarmed the fascists. On Monday, British housewives will be able to buy only four ounces of pure butter for the week, a cut of two ounces. They can still buy a combined butter-margarine total of six ounces. One little news item that had to come had just appeared in the press. The first shelter baby has been born in London. It's a boy born in an Anderson iron shelter during a night raid over the city. Mother and child are doing well. I return you to CBS New York. That was Eric Severide reporting from London. Here is a press association dispatch from Athens. The Greek War Ministry says that three additional categories of specialists and reservists have been called to the colors. At the same time, three categories of trained artillery reserves have been released. Now the news reported direct from the German capital by William L. Shira. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Columbia in New York, calling William L. Shara in Berlin. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Columbia, New York, calling William L. Shara in Berlin. Go ahead, Berlin.
We regret, ladies and gentlemen, that we are unable this morning to contact our correspondent who was supposed to report from Berlin this morning. We've just been informed, however, that William L. Shara is now ready to report from Berlin. Go ahead, Berlin. Important military objectives continually attacked. And most of the first page is given over to the report of German air attacks on Britain. On page five of the Bay Z, there is a one paragraph account of last night's air raid alarm. It reads as follows, quote, Last night between 12.24 and 3.17 a.m., there was an air raid alarm in Berlin. Some British planes appeared at short intervals over the metropolitan district of Greater Berlin and dropped incendiary and high explosive bombs on residential districts and suburbs. Military objectives were not attacked, unquote. The paragraph continues, quote, The damage done is insignificant. At several places in the center of the city, roof fires were caused, but were quickly extinguished by the ARP service. Ten persons were killed, and 28 were wounded. None of the killed and injured had taken refuge in the air raid cellars. End of quote. Well, that's the official communique on the air raid we had here last night. About an hour after the raid, the propaganda ministry conducted the foreign correspondence around the city to observe the damage. In the Kotbusser Strasse, about a thousand yards from the railroad station in the southeast part of Berlin, two 110-pound bombs had landed in the street, torn off the leg of an air raid warden standing at the entrance to his house, and killed four men and two women who unwisely were standing in the doorway. The propaganda ministry also conducted the journalists to the airfield at Tempelhof, the Klingenberg Electrical Works, and to the Siemens factory, which makes armaments, where nothing untoward was observed. Most of last night's activity appeared to be to the west and north, northwest of the city. According to a bulletin just issued here, German planes last night heavily bombed Liverpool, especially the docks there and at Birkenhead across the Mersey River. Other German bombs were thrown on Middlesbrough, Thameshaven, and Chatham. The conferences at Vienna between the German and Italian foreign ministers with, their, with the foreign ministers of Hungary, Hungary and Romania over the future status of Transylvania began this morning. Herr von Ribbentrop and Count Chano first conferred with Count Schacke, the Hungarian foreign minister, and later in the morning they received Mr. Manolescu, the Romanian foreign minister. Probably this afternoon there will be a combined meeting of the foreign ministers when the sort of agreement that Berlin and Rome thinks fair will be announced. Four Turks, including a Turkish newspaper man, were arrested here today as reprisal for the arrest of a German bookstore owner in Istanbul. They were shackled and taken to police headquarters. The Germans charged that the German in Istanbul, who was, arrest who was arrested, was led shackled through the streets to jail. This is William L. Shire in Berlin, returning out of Columbia, New York. And here's a dispatch from Cairo. A Royal Air Force communique reports that on Tuesday, British planes bombed shipping in the harbor of Denna, Libya, setting a fire to ships. The British claim also to have raided Nokra Island in the Red Sea and to have attacked the Hara and Desi military headquarters in Ethiopia. Cecil Brown is now standing by in the Italian capital to give you the latest news from there. Go ahead, Rome. This is Rome. For the first time in the war, Italian bombers attacked the Suez Canal. The high command has just announced that fascist raiders dropped bombs on the British naval base at Alexandria, then went on to raid Suez. The war communique reports bombs were dropped on the northern entrance of the canal. Other bombs were directed against the ferry service at Al Kantara. By means of this ferry, the railway crosses the canal from Egypt to Palestine. Bitter fighting took place in East Africa as well. The Italians say that bands of Dubats, native fascist troops, have occupied the British port of Pernignac. This fort is in the region of Lake Rudolf, which divides southwestern Ethiopia and Kenya. In Kenya itself, the Italian bombers raided the airports of Wajir and Garissa. Better fighting took place at the boundary between the Sudan and Italian Eritrea. According to the Italians, a British contingent, supported by armored cars, attempted a raid into Italian territory. The battle site was near the wells of Adar Day. There, a group of native Oscaries, Reinforced by native police troops faced the British. Heavy fighting followed, and the communique says the British were repulsed. The British carried away numerous wounded on their armored cars. But the communique adds that about 10 Australians were found dead on the ground. 
The Italians say their losses were slight and report the capture of some machine guns and rifles. In the eastern Sudan, strong British patrols launched an attack against the Italian coast of Garabat. The communique says the Italian troops holding the fort easily repulsed the British. Garabat is directly across the frontier from Ethiopia and was captured by the Italians early in July. The press here today believes that a solution will be found in Vienna to the differences between Romania and Hungary. Neutral circles here have the same impression. It said the agreement probably will result in Romania giving up more than the four departments of Transylvania she has suggested, and Hungary accepting less than the 14 departments she has demanded. In other words, Kuntzer and Herr von Ribbentrop may effect a compromise so that a good portion of Transylvania goes to Hungary. As we see it here, King Carol is confident that the Axis will not allow a Balkan war. Knowing that, he can put up a show of force that might induce the Axis powers to shave down the Hungarian demand. 24,000 fascist youth of pre-military age are on the march in Italy today. They are finishing up a period of training. These are boys of 18 and 19 years old, and soon they will be in the regular army. This present crop of boys was born into fascism, and they represent the last word in fascist training. When they go into the army, they go in as trained soldiers, ready for the front lines in a few weeks. At their age, many of us were boy scouts back home, taking hikes and working in nerve badges to become eagle scouts. These boys are different. They are expert on guns. Some of them are on the way to being pilots, machine guys. Since the age of six, these boys have been carrying a gun, marching on training, learning discipline. Their watchword has been Liberto e Moschetto, in other words, book and rifle. They believe implicitly in Mussolini's other great order to the people, believe, obey, fight. Since they were six years old, their bodies, minds, hearts, and spirits have been directed to the destiny they are about to serve. They have watched thousands of these boys marching, those of six and seven years old, and those of 18 and 19. Their discipline is perfect. I've talked with many of them, too. There's no mental confusion about them. They have been told the destiny of their country and the goodness of their cause, and they believe in it. Five million boys between 6 and 20 wear a uniform and carry a rifle in this country. Those boys who are marching over the hills of Italy today with 60 pounds on their back, husky, stocky, tan boys, are the new generation of Italian soldiers. They were born when Mussolini and his black shirt legions already had marched on Rome. And with these news reports from Rome, reported by Cecil Brown, Columbia concludes another of these morning reports of European developments, which comes to you each morning at this time and each evening at 6.45 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Eric Severide reported from London, William L. Shira reported from Berlin, and Cecil Brown from Rome. Larry Elliott speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcast.